Uh, just to very quickly before we start address some of the questions coming through the chat box, um, there will be a recorded version available. You can either pull it up on our Facebook uh, page or um, you can email us and we'll send you the link to the recording. Uh, our YouTube page should also have it uh, uploaded uh, soon after the program. Um, and then also William is asking about the images be being out of focus. It's possible that it's the speed of your internet connection. It depends on how fast your internet connection is in terms of the clarity of the uh, the image on your screen. We'll start here in one minute. It's now 529. Okay, I, I wanted to welcome everybody to our uh, special happy hour program tonight, our free program on uh, modernism. This is part of a seven part series. Uh, my name is John Haber. I'm the Field Services Director for the California Preservation Foundation. With me tonight is also uh, Chris Madrid French, French, and in a minute here, mm -hmm. I'll turn it over to her. I wanted to welcome everybody to tonight's webinar entitled Capturing Modernism with Photographer Darren Bradley. Um, also wanted to uh, encourage you to look at our website to look into membership. You can find membership information on our website at californiapreservation.org slash join. The California Preservation Foundation is a membership based not for profit organization whose mission is to provide statewide leadership in education and advocacy to ensure protection of historic resources in California. The format for today's program will include a panelist for a total of up to uh, 50 to uh, around 60 minutes and then we'll follow that with uh, Q and A and forum. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions, you can use the chat but uh, chat button at the bottom of your screen. You may also use the Q and A button, which is right next to the chat button. Speakers can answer your question by typing in a response, or uh, most likely, uh, Darren will address it at the end during the Q and A period um, at the end of the presentation. If you're attached to a microphone, you can grant the webinar room voice access to your microphone when asked to do so. Your voice will be muted during most of the presentation, but you can click the raise hand button by clicking by clicking that button. You will uh, we can enable your voice and and or your video, and that will allow you to ask your question or have a discussion with our panelists in person. Um, if for some reason your sound does not work, you will need to type in your question or response using the chat button. I'm now going to turn it over to our uh, communications and development director, Chris Madrid French. Um, take it away. Hey, John, uh, thank you so much. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. I want to share my screen just for a minute here uh, to thank our sponsors uh, who are helping make these free programs possible for all of us. And as, whoop, as I go through that, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we do encourage everyone to chat while we are having the presentation. If the chat box uh, sort of gets in the way of, of, of the uh, images, you might want to close the chat box or you can actually pop it out and push it to the side. Uh, this program is part of our modernist series. Uh, it's a seven part program. There are three uh, paid um, programs that you can join and also a number of free ones. So tonight, of course, is with photographer Darren Bradley. Thank you, Darren, for joining us. And then we have Barbara Lamprecht coming up on one other. And then also myself talking about Alfred Hitchcock. We would encourage everybody to become a member of California Preservation uh, Foundation. You can join us at our website. We have a lot of fun stuff coming up and uh, we, you can get access to all of our programs. Our free programs are recorded and available on Facebook and our YouTube channels. We are announcing tonight, this is the first time we're announcing this, a brand new program, which is a trivia night for uh, members only limited to the first 48 participants but you can also participate on your own on Facebook Live. Uh, but if you'd like to join us in the Zoom room, 
uh, this is a new opportunity so you can meet new people and make friends with everyone. It's also being sponsored by Chafe at HabsPhoto.com. And I'd like to just mention that Darren has worked on a number of books with Sam the Bell. There's a couple, of, there's only a few available still on Amazon, I just checked. It's Mid-Century Modern Architecture Travel Guides. And there's something that you might want to uh, indulge in, especially since we're all sort of isolated in our own places. It's a way that you can still enjoy all the architecture of, um, that Darren's going to be presenting to you tonight. So Darren, do we got you? There you are. <laughs> there. Um, you can go ahead anytime you want. This is welcome to Darren Bradley. All right, thank you, Chris. And thanks, John. I uh, appreciate you having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Let me see if I can figure this out. Um, all right, can everybody see my screen, the slide presentation? Hopefully. Yep, it looks great. Okay, good. So uh, what I was going to talk about was um, capturing modernism and you notice today in brackets there uh, because uh, photographing uh, properties or projects, buildings that are in many cases 50, 60 years old uh, present some challenges compared to what it was like photographing them when they were new. Uh, and so I'll share a bit of that and just some of my insight and it's probably mostly just a pretense for being able to show off a little bit. So. Um, bear with me. But um, anyway, a little bit about myself. Most of you, or some of you anyway, should know a little bit about me, hopefully. That's probably why you're here. Um, but uh, just, you know, I, I understand we're always supposed to introduce ourselves, so I'll, I'll go through a little bit of that. Um, born in Hawaii, uh, so yeah, Kamaina, uh, special place in my heart there. Uh, moved to San Diego when I was little, though, and I was kind of raised uh, here in San Diego, where I am presently. Uh, I did uh, go to France for a while, and I did get my degree in history from the Sorbonne at the University of Paris. Uh, so I, uh, in addition to the photography side, I do like the history bit of it uh, quite a bit. Uh, and if, for those of you who are uh, following me on Instagram, for example, I will often in the captions write a bit of historical context about what, I, what I'm photographing just for fun. Uh, and that goes into the books too that Christine was just talking about. Um, but anyway, after uh, graduating from the University of Paris, I did come back to San Diego, and uh, that's where I am today. Although I have had the opportunity to work and, and live and travel in quite a few other places around the world since then. Uh, one in particular has a special place in my heart. A uh, shout out to all my friends in Australia, um, who, uh, you know, I, I really, really love the architecture there. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to work there uh, for a better part of 10 years on and off. Uh, and I've done quite a bit of stuff uh, relating to their mid-century modern architecture and trying to get involved in the historic preservation there. And I even gave a TED talk there uh, on the architecture in, uh, in Canberra, in fact, uh, which is really, if, if you're not familiar with it or you haven't seen it, I highly recommend going uh, when we were able to travel again, of course. Um, but it's uh, really a haven for mid-century modern architecture and it's, it's an amazing place. Uh, so why mid-century modern architecture? Um, mostly because of stuff like this, I guess. I, I just love, I, this is just, you know, crazy to me. And I love that it is. And I love that there was a period in time when people wouldn't hesitate to design and build stuff like this. Uh, and why I photograph it today is, um, as you know, I put the quote in my Instagram profile, it's not what you look at, it's what you see. Um, just getting people to stop and notice these buildings is, is really important to me. Uh, I find so many people just walk by them or drive past these amazing uh, buildings uh, because you get blind to them after a while and you don't really see them or appreciate them. So if I can take photos of them in a way that gets people to, to stop and notice them and, and maybe appreciate them, uh, hopefully that helps with the, with the preservation side of things as well. Uh, so um, architectural photography, since I guess that's what we're here for after all, or at least that's what I'm here for. Um, and how does it differ from normal photography? I know a lot of people, it's a bit like, you know, when you own a pickup truck and everybody asks to help you move. Um, when you're a photographer, an architectural photographer, you got a camera, everybody asks you to take pictures of birthday parties and portraits and stuff like that. But architectural photographers are quite a different lot, actually. Um, and architectural photography is really quite different from, from normal, normal photography. Um, for example, uh, what is an architectural photograph? This is an ad in Prada. They did a big ad campaign a few years ago with this really cool brutalist house in New York. Um, but yes, it's a picture of the building, but you know, the focus is really on the people here. 
and you notice the the walls are kind of crooked they're slanted and stuff that's because the photographer here obviously wasn't an architectural photographer he was just using this as background um, an architectural photograph would be um, much more focused on the building there might be people in it but it will be about the building at the end of the day and despite all of the challenges uh, we will do as much as possible to try to maintain the integrity of the building and the structural integrity and make it look as close as possible as how it, you could experience it in real life. Uh, so you try to avoid crooked walls and that sort of thing. Uh, so unlike most photographers who are kind of geeked out about their equipment, you know, they'll bore you all day about the new Leica they just bought or uh, they have all kinds of uh, things they like to say about pixels not mattering and things like that. Um, all of that stuff applies to just about every type of photography except architectural photography. So we're kind of the loners and the weirdos of the photography world. Um, because instead of talking about photography, most architectural photographers would rather talk about architecture. Um, and most of us came to this world through architecture, not through photography. We kind of had to figure out how to do the photography part, but the architecture is what we really cared about. Um, so um, that said, there's, I've got plenty of examples. Some of them are my own. Some of them are what other photographers did when they attempted to do architectural photography. Uh, just so you can identify a bad picture. Because I get people sending me photos all the time saying, can go take photos like this of a project, and they usually end up looking like examples I'm including in here. Uh, so obviously avoid crooked walls, um, avoid heavy lens distortion. I get this all the time where people think they can go buy a super ultra wide angle lens or a fish eye and then get everything in, uh, and it's not a good idea. Um, don't do keystoning. If you can avoid it, that's where that, that, that effect where if you, show, if you tilt the camera up, and I'll talk about this a little more later, uh, and the walls look like they kind of are collapsing in on themselves, um, that's, that's kind of a no-no in the architecture photography world. Um, high dynamic range. This is, the, this is kind of a fancy word, but what it is is you take lots of different photos of the same thing without moving the camera. Uh, at different exposures, and then you combine them all into one thing. And it usually ends up looking like something on, on Mars or some weird planet. I absolutely hate this effect, but I see it all the time on Instagram. Fortunately, it's waning a little bit, but you still see it a little bit. But to me, it always reminds me, there are people that are into this thing, and it reminds me of kind of, of Thomas Kincaid paintings. Uh, but you know, there are people into that too, so who am I to judge, I guess. Um, but in general, oversaturation of colors is kind of something I try to stay away from. Uh, as well as filters and stuff like that. But, um, and then the other ones kind of similar to the past ones is really zoomy. Yes, it's possible to get the whole building in with a crazy ultra wide angle lens, but do you really want to? Um, not necessarily, because I think this is kind of a, you know, I, everyone's guilty of doing this at first. In fact, I've done a few of these myself, but um, just don't. Um, and then black and white, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people try to save a bad photo by making, turning it into a black and white photo. Uh, it doesn't make it better. It really doesn't. And I can be really critical of this one because it's my own photo, but um, yeah, it sucks. Don't, just don't do that. Um, so what are the challenges of photographing mid-century modern architecture versus new, ar new architecture? So I do both. Uh, in fact, most of my work is for architects shooting their stuff today. But if you follow my Instagram, you know that I mostly don't post that. I post the stuff of my own projects, uh, mid-century modern and stuff like that. Um, bigger bushes is definitely a big problem. Um, so uh, this is the kind of thing I often have to deal with when I'm trying to photograph a historic property, a mid-century modern property. Um, obviously, if you're talking about like Julius Schulman, this is one of his photos. He didn't really have this problem. Um, this is a photo, one of the photos he took of a Cliff May Rancho in, I think, Long Beach. Um, here's a behind the scenes view of that. Uh, so you can tell, I mean, there was really nothing around. He, he typically would show up in a station wagon. Uh, he'd stop at the garden store before he'd go to a project site, buy a bunch of plants, leave them in the pots, fill them, put them all around the house, and then shoot the property and then return them to the garden center and get refunded at the end of the day. That was like his normal tactic. But, um, and you notice the tree branch that he ripped off of some nearby tree as well. Um, and then here's another example of doing this at the stall house. Um, he's got like an assistant holding up a branch underneath him here. Uh, so I have kind of the opposite problem with that. There's usually too much going on. 
Um, this is so this is the kind of thing he was dealing with just a you know basically a dirt lot so he had to figure out how to make it look lush uh, and today uh, trees grow and uh, it doesn't look like that anymore and most people don't really pay attention or they try to hide what they've got behind the bushes anyway. Um, this is another photo of this by Ezra Stoller another well known my favorite personally architectural photographer but at the time. Um, so this historic photo of a building in Columbus, Indiana, and look at the tree on the right there, pay close attention to that. And then this is a photo I, for fun, just tried to reproduce this photo a few years ago. That's what the tree looks like today. Um, unfortunately, the other tree, which would have totally ruined the shot, was gone, so I didn't have to deal with that. But um, just, to, and then I, this is an evening shot I took, I went back later that night and took, so you can see, um, did this in this case it was fairly easy to deal with because I think the tree adds to it now but a lot of times you saw from that first photo it just doesn't work. Uh, another issue that I have to deal with is cars. At the time there were a lot fewer cars out there and delivery vans especially. Um, so uh, this is something to watch out for. This is something that I have to deal with. When I was doing the mid-century modern guide for the east coast I did pretty much the entire eastern seaboard in one go in like two weeks, except New York City, uh, because there were so many cars and delivery vans parked in front of everything. It actually took me five separate trips to New York City to get all the shots I needed, plus all the scaffolding and everything else. I think, but there's always something, regardless, if there's a delivery van anywhere around, it's gonna park there and it's gonna sit there. This delivery van is probably still there for all I know, uh, but it was there the entire day. It didn't, did not move. Um, I had to actually end up Photoshopping it out by reversing what I saw on the right hand side and putting it on the left. Um, so if you look, if you do get the book and see, you'll see that I kind of had to fake it. But if I didn't tell you that, hopefully you wouldn't have noticed. Um, here's a UPS van. They're kind of my nemesis. I like getting packages from UPS, UPS just like everyone else, but I curse them whenever I see them around because I know inevitably they'll be parked in front of my project, whatever I want to shoot. Um, and then the CenturyLink van, I've been to this, this particular building in Portland twice, and both times there was a CenturyLink van parked in front of it, just pretty much on the same spot. Um, so, um, you know, what are you going to do? And then again, I love this shot, but that damn Toyota Camry would not move. And I was there for several hours waiting for that thing to go, sitting having like a coffee on the, across the street. So that's just something to deal with. Um, Bad signage is another thing to deal with. You know, at the time, architects would design really cool signs and integrate them into the building in a really classy, minimalist way. Um, now the name of the game is just be garish and nobody really cares. They just hang their crappy signs anywhere. Uh, like this building, which is in Canberra, Australia, in fact. Um, you know, that sign, it's just, just kind of ruins it. Um, insensitive remodeling. Uh, you'll see this a lot. Uh, this is in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and then in the 80s, or maybe it was the early 90s, the owner of this building decided this building looked like the Jetsons and commissioned another architect to make it look more like the Jetsons. So this was what they did. Uh, they kind of added another piece to it, and then they added those kind of weird rings and everything, which doesn't really do much for me. And then they changed the glass and everything, too. But uh, and that's kind of unfortunate, but I, you, you, I often run into stuff like that. So then I end up trying to figure out a way to focus on the original elements of it instead. Um, a lot of times, like this building in San Diego, you'll see that all the interesting elements of a building are kind of stripped out over time, especially when it's getting ready to be sold. Anything that looks unique or stands out, they'll just get rid of. So you'll see this is the same building today. They basically, you want to see, I'll go back real quick so you can take a look and compare. It's there. So you can see that it's just not, I mean, this sort of thing is just heartbreaking, but you see it all the time. Wouldn't take much to bring it back to the way it was, but I don't know why people would prefer this instead. Plus you get the extra points for the really bad signage. Um, here's a bowling alley in um, Honolulu and Kahala. Um, now, it closed a few years ago and McDonald's leased the building, but they didn't need the whole building. They just wanted part of it and they didn't really care about the architecture. So this is what they did. They added a drive through window over to that one side and just left the rest of it like it is. Um, all right, it's technical stuff. So um, perspective control. Now, this is what I was referring to before when we were talking about making sure the lines stay, stay straight. Uh, architectural photographers spend a lot of time trying to make the line stay straight. There are times when you're looking straight up at a building from down below, like a tower especially, 
when you don't care, it's, it's kind of nice to have that keystoning effect and it's natural to do. If you're right below a building, it looks fine. But there are times when you don't want that. Like in for this building here in San Francisco, I, yes, it would have been okay to do this, but I wanted to do kind of a head on just pure elevation shot of it. So I tried to fix it in Photoshop, which was okay a little bit, but you can see it kind of cuts off the corners because I hadn't taken those. Um, but I had other shots where I'd kind of gotten that and I was able to use data from elsewhere in the building. So I was able to fix it eventually. Um, but that's the, the kind of thing that you can do in Photoshop, fortunately. Uh, is it cheating? Maybe, but on the other hand, all I'm doing is reproducing what the building actually looks like. And I know I'm pretty sure Shafe is on the call and you know he's a Habs photographer, so he's just about documenting historic buildings as they look today. And he was probably, you know, basically yelling at the screen right now in horror. Uh, but the, I, I mean, I, my view is that I'm not a Habs photographer. I'm just trying to capture uh, the spirit of the building and the way it looks. Um, so another example of trying to fix keystoning, um, if you tilt the camera up to catch everything, which is what most people do, the, the walls kind of collapse and tilt in on themselves. If you hold the camera straight, completely um, ver perpendicular, uh, 90 degrees, you will see, you notice that the walls straighten out, but then you cut off the top of the building. So what I use, what uh, most architectural photographers use is a special kind of lens called a tilt shift lens or perspective control lens. And we just use the shift part of that. And we can actually move the lens up a little bit and then that enables us to capture uh, the whole building and less of the street in front of us. Now you notice that there would still be work to do here and I'll talk about that in a second because the buildings are kind of curved a little bit because of the lens distortion. But here's another example. Uh, it doesn't even have to be a tower. This is a church in San Diego and Carlsbad. Um, I took a picture, you notice Murphy's Law, you got the um, Volkswagen parked in front there. Like, it, you know, there's always gonna be a car parked in front of you, whatever you're trying to photograph. Uh, but you notice that I held the, the camera straight on a tripod, uh, but I cut off the top of the building by doing that. So then I, I slid the lens up and I cut up, I got the top part of the building and then I stitched them together. Uh, it's not done though, it's because these are raw images. So they're kind of desaturated and there's all kinds of um, stuff in the, in the way. So then, it, you know, an hour or so of Photoshop later and I removed the power lines and the light pole and the Volkswagen and uh, then you have a photo. So that's kind of how that, how that works. Um, you can also use that kind of lens because it doesn't just move up and down. You can move all the way around as well like in a circular motion. So for the interior of this church in Tacoma, Washington, uh, it was a vast church and I wanted to capture lots of the different elements, especially the roof. So I took a photo of the uh, main altar, slid the camera to the left. I went up and then I went up to the left. And then you have four separate images there and then you stitch those together and it allows you to get an image that no, no lens or camera could ever reproduce on its own. Um, so you can get a much uh, broader, wider view of, of a place. Um, I mentioned lens distortion. So every lens basically has some distortion to it and it will change what the image looks like. So this is what we call pin cushion distortion and you can see what that effect, the effect looks like. See barrel distortion um, as well and that's, um, you know, that kind of is the opposite effect. And then, um, so here's an example, like with a wide angle lens, what happens? Uh, this is in mid-century modern, obviously. Many of you recognize this as Singapore and it's a fairly recent project, but it's a good example of what, what the lens will do if you just take a wide angle lens and shoot a building. So you notice that in the middle, it's more or less looks normal, but then you got the corners that are getting pulled off to the side. Um, no architect would want to see their project that looks like that, you know, looks like saltwater toffee or something like our taffy. But uh, so um, what we have to do is um, actually manually go into Photoshop and stretch and pull just like you would taffy and put it back together again. Uh, and it's a pain to do. This took several hours, actually. Uh, and I didn't do it for a client. I just did it because I'm a masochist. And I was bored in a plane, uh, so I had nothing better to do. But I, I think it's a good example of what is possible, but it takes a lot of work. Um, and so one of the, the key thing that architectural photographers are doing is constantly fighting against lens distortion to recreate what the eye would see and experience uh, for a piece of architecture. 
Now going back to mid-century modern architecture, this is the kind of, uh, this is a classic example. This is a bank in Phoenix. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Uh, but you notice on the right-hand side of the image, we're starting to get some crazy stretching and distortion there. Um, those, are, those aren't really oblong. Uh, those, those circular shades are actually completely circular. Uh, so what I had to do is, is go in and manually fix them and, and make them look like they really did in real life with the human eye. Uh, and that takes a lot of time. Uh, same thing happens for cylindrical buildings or round buildings. Um, the only way to fight, if you're trying to shoot a building with a camera that's round, unless you're dead centered, if you're dead centered of the building, it will look round. If you have it off in any way to the side of the frame, it turns into this weird oblong thing. Um, so the key is to just make sure that you're centered on the round structure when you're shooting it which is kind of hard and possible to do sometimes, especially if you've got more than one cylinder that you're trying to shoot at once. Um, so I curse people, architects that design round buildings because they make my life really miserable. Um, but then you, what you have to do is manually go in and adjust all of them and fix it and then try to readjust the foreground so that you're not distorting anything at the same time and you're only affecting the, the building, the round building in question. Um, it's not just round buildings though. Here's that same church in Harlem uh, that you saw the Camry in front of as an example before. Um, okay, a little zoomy because I used a really wide angle to catch this. I uh, didn't love that, but can anyone, I'm sure you can notice the one thing that really bugs me is the building in the background. Um, so because it didn't, it wasn't really curved like that by the human eye, it was, it looked perfectly normal. Um, so I had to fix that. I'm sure most people wouldn't notice, but I did and it, I just, it drove me nuts. So I, I went back and changed it. Um, let's see, where, where am I? Go ahead. Um, this is the library at UCSD in San Diego, just right up the road from me. Uh, most pictures that I've seen of this library when they're shot from this angle look like this or even more exaggerated where the ends kind of tilt up and it looks like a bird trying to take flight or something. Uh, so the way, the reason for that is also because of where you're standing in relation to the lens and that wide angle lens is going to want to pull everything up. So, um, stand back a little further and get a little higher to negate that tendency and you can create a view. I'll go back again so you can see, um, you know, this is, this is what not to do. Basically, this will create a lot of distortion and give a different impression of the building entirely, almost as if those sides are kind of tilted up. Uh, whereas in reality, if you're looking at it in person, it looks much more like this. Still not exactly like this if you saw it in person, but closer. Um, same thing if you're shooting head on, this is the main entrance. Uh, but I'm shooting with a really wide angle lens and I'm way too close to the building. So you see what it's doing is it's really, especially those upper floors, it's really pulling that stuff up and towards me and really making the building uh, look crazy cantilever and stretched out and it shouldn't. Uh, so step back a little further and adjust the lens and you create a much more faithful view of what the building is supposed to look like. So um, that basically get, hits, that's a nice segue into um, that old idiom that Ansel Adams said, or, you know, about a good photograph is knowing where to stand. Um, so just like those two previous examples, uh, you can change completely the aspect depending on where you are. Um, that can come in handy for a lot of reasons. Be careful, watch what's going on in the background, uh, because the, here's an example of this, uh, the ice rink at Yale, uh, classic Saarinen uh, project, but notice that building in the background. Uh, so if you just take, start shooting away without paying attention and you get back, you're going to have a lot of Photoshop in front of you if you want it to look halfway decent, or you can kind of move a little closer and to the left and you can hide the building completely behind that other building. So this, I just changed the angle slightly. I didn't actually clone that building out. I didn't Photoshop it at all. I just used a different angle to hide what was behind me, what was behind that building rather. Um, here's another example. This is, uh, an, well, another Saarinen project as it would happen. And this one's in Columbus, Indiana, uh, the, the North Christian Church. So if you get really close with a 17 millimeter, which is a super ultra wide, uh, and, you know, angle lens, you can get a nice shot, uh, looks good, but it looks like the building is square. 
Uh, whereas if you step back a little bit, the building's not actually square, and I'll show you that in a minute. But if you step back a little bit, you can kind of see that the building's actually a hexagon. Uh, but you can only get a better idea of it if you step back to, to catch more of the building. Um, so here's an aerial view of it. This isn't my photo either. Um, but uh, anyway, this gives you an idea of what it actually looks like. So that's just, what, what happens is if you're getting up close to it, especially a building like this, you're effectively, your sight line is such that you, you're not going to see those other sides at all. And it just looks like a square. So all you're seeing is just what's directly in front of you there. That's the only part that's visible. And so I, it's sometimes I think that architects were just like messing with photographers because they, they knew that this would be kind of an optical illusion and it would be impossible to frustrate us forever to try to try to fix that. But you only really see what the building looks like as you're approaching it, even in person when you're inside and you get an idea for its hexagonal shape. Um, domes are also another challenge. Uh, so this is the uh, this is a building in Canberra as well in Australia. Um, domes are funny because the further back you are, the bigger they look. And I've actually posted about this on Instagram before and had people tell me I was full of crap, but it's true and I'll prove it to you. So here's the far away. Here's kind of the middle distance. And if you notice, uh, you see more of those arches here than you do here. Um, and then if you get really close, it looks tiny. Now this is a huge building. This is a big auditorium inside actually. And you can't, it looks just like a, like a little snack bar or a hut or something. Uh, and the reason for that is the same thing as for that hexagonal church. Um, when you're far away and you're looking at a dome or a circle like this, more of the building looks visible. When you get closer, you can only see a little bit of it. So you see the hidden part is much more. See what I'm doing there? Anyway, um, so that's something I'm constantly having to be conscious of. And depending on the sight lines, I can make a building look really big or really small. Even approaching the dome, the height of it, you know, if I'm far away, I can see the top of the dome. But if I'm closer, I can't. And I can't even see where the top is. So the building looks shorter as well. Um, now let's talk about the sun a little bit. So the sun to me is everything. I know regular photographers, they love to talk about cloudy weather and talk about, oh, this is great photo weather. And architects tell me this too sometimes because everyone knows that it's great to take photos in cloudy weather. That's good for portraits maybe, but it's terrible for buildings. So this is, um, this is the Wiley House, Philip Johnson in New Canaan. Uh, I was there for take, shooting this for the guidebook and it was really horrible weather, rainy, foggy and stuff. Uh, fortunately, we had some sun the next day so I took it from pretty much the exact same spot. And you can see though, it's, it's really a world of difference. Uh, it's, it, it changes everything. It really just makes it pop. Um, so I actually like really high, bright, intense, high contrast stuff. Um, you know, when it's gray weather, when you've got like in, in California, especially Southern California, we get the marine layer where just this flat gray light and it's just lots of glare and everything just turns, it, nothing pops, everything looks flat. Um, but then if you get some light, some sunlight, uh, it really, the whole place comes alive. Um, here's another Saarinen project. I like Saarinen, so I put a lot of this stuff in. Um, but anyway, this is uh, Dulles Airport. Decent enough photo, I suppose, and there was even sun out there, but it wasn't in the right spot. This is it in an early morning shot. And so you can see the whole, this is from the same angle, but the building looks completely different depending on where the sun is. Um, you can see like these sunbeams, these sun rays. I actually um, went outside and grabbed a handful of dirt. So apologies to the church and kind of threw it in the air to make those sunbeams more exaggerated to create a kind of a dust cloud to make that. But I, I shouldn't reveal my secrets because now they'll be mad at me. Um, sometimes you get lucky too. The building, this, this, this circular um, parking garage was uh, what I was there to photograph in Pittsburgh. And I kind of guessed that I would be have a window uh, in between the two buildings where the light would shine on it if the sun came out that morning and it did. Uh, and so you can use sun to really highlight a particular building and keep the others kind of in the dark uh, or play with different effects. Most shots of this, you can't really tell that there's the, these concrete forms are separated by glass. Uh, so I wanted that. Uh, so I looked at when I would be, when the sun would cast a light through there so that you could, it would exaggerate that separation between those two uh, concrete blocks. Uh, it's also fun to capture people like walking towards the light because there's sort of this sense of optimism and 
you know, everyone, it's kind of natural to want to go towards the light and your eye leads that way anyway. So um, it, it's kind of fun that way. And here's another example of that from a slightly different angle. Um, just capturing, even shooting directly into the sun will, can, can create a nice effect. Um, isolating the, the subject is another key thing to try to do just to let, let the building speak for itself. Because as I said, so many buildings have a lot of clutter in them. Uh, so you want to just kind of get rid of that clutter uh, just by trying to trim away some of the stuff and darken what's around it and just let that building go um, and let that building kind of speak for itself. And I'm not really doing anything. I'm just putting it out there and letting people notice it. Um, another example, this is a, in, in uh, Wildwood, New Jersey, just a little motel. Uh, and the weather was terrible. It had been raining all really bad all day, uh, but it just came across that building and just sitting by itself like that. And it just it worked for me. Um, using details. Now, this is kind of important, especially compared to, you know, relating to that older, the, the previous photo that I had with all the bushes and overgrown vegetation. A lot of times you've got like construction debris and things like that around. Uh, and you're not able to take the whole building like in those previous two shots. Uh, so what do you do? You just try to find like one corner of the building that hasn't been messed with or that's clearly visible and just look at that. So this is like a church in Switzerland, for example, in Basel, where there was um, scaffolding around and there was there were cars parked in front of it. So I couldn't really get a good exterior shot of the, the whole church, but I just focused on this little um, entrance, this entryway here. Not little, really. It's kind of a grand one. Uh, but anyway... Uh, to kind of capture the rest of the feeling of what it was like to be at that church, just looking at one little corner detail. Here's a, um, a Simbers Richards house in San Diego. It's very difficult. It's, um, it would be impossible to photograph the whole house, the way it's situated on the lot. And there's lots of old vegetation there. This is obviously mid-century modern property uh, on a cliff. So what I did though, is that I found a corner of the building of the house and I just photographed it and kind of tried to capture the feeling of what it was like to experience the house. And you can kind of get an idea for the architecture, for the style, uh, for everything by just looking at this one little corner uh, and not having to worry about capturing the entire building. Uh, here's a house in Palm Springs, uh, a William Chrysler design in Twin Palms and uh, same sort of idea. Uh, there's lots of vegetation around, lots of gardening, and it's also, this is one of these very long, flat uh, roofed houses, so um, very difficult to photograph in any sort of dramatic way because it just looks long, low, and linear. Uh, so get up close to it and just photograph a piece of it, uh, catch a corner of the car to kind of uh, put the, you know, the feeling of the mid-century vibe in, in, and just in some palm trees and just sort of capture a mood uh, using some of the elements of the house and not everything. Uh, this was just a uh, an old A and P market uh, that William Kreisel had designed as well, actually. And um, the front of it was full of garish posters and signage and all kinds of crap and stuff. So there was very it was it would have been impossible to capture the feeling of that being at the this supermarket or the original design of it from it. So I went around to the back, and I just found this little lonesome corner and just the 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 shadow block and and just the forms that were enough to just tell the story. And that's I think that's the only photo I took of that that market. And in this case, this is Palm Springs as well. You probably recognize Idris House. Uh, I was there for a house tour, literally crawling with people everywhere. There was no way to get a decent shot of anything. So I just went to the corner and I just took the snap in, you know, the one moment when nobody happened to be in my shot and just, just went away with that. Uh, so repeating patterns. A lot of mid-century modern architecture has uh, it's kind of an obsession with repeating patterns, like those shadow block photos you saw in the earlier one. I really like that. Uh, and I like to kind of show that in contrast with nature. And so this is the Breuer project. This is um, in the Bronx, uh, school in the Bronx uh, that he had done. Uh, I like that. I also, I talk about people in shots later, but I like sort of the dramatic scale. I like the, I like showing, you know, Breuer was kind of master, a master of showing pattern in his concrete. Uh, and and the, it would transform the way the building looked depending on the time of day. So these shadows would form and unform and, and change, transform throughout the day and create these different patterns on the side of the building. And I just love that. So I'm just trying to, to capture that in some way. Um, this Pereira building at UCI, UC Irvine, 
uh, was all about sort of these sculptural forms. So just trying to show that as well. I like these repeating patterns kind of splicing through and they let you follow the eye. Uh, this is just a, a, a building, I think it's an office building in, in Abu Dhabi. Um, and, uh, you know, just the kind of the, the randomness of everything with the bicyclist and the barbed wire and then showing sort of the repeating pattern sort of calms the eye. There's a lot of chaos going on and then you, you, you seek solace in seeing this sort of repeating pattern and, and you, you keep returning to that. Um, this is a liquor store in Cathedral City outside of Palm Springs, kind of the same deal. I like finding these sort of unassuming buildings with uh, notions of grandeur that nobody really pays attention to. I mean, people drive by this all the time and it's kind of sad looking now, but I, you can tell that one time it, it aspired to be great and I was trying to do it some justice. Um, so, uh, Carascaro, so uh, high contrast. So again, with the patterns, now this obviously is the Yale uh, Library, Rare Book Library. This is an Ezra Stoller photo. You can see how important it is to shoot in high contrast and direct sunlight in this image. When I was there the first time, it was uh, cold gray, it was about to snow. And you can see kind of the same, I took this for the fun, I took the same angle. That's, yes, that's me in the foreground. I couldn't find anyone else to sit there. Um, but uh, it totally changes it. It, does, it looks completely different as a result of that. Uh, and it, so you can see, I mean, it just comes alive in a very different way when you're doing direct sunlight. So I have had a chance of going several times and I have been there since when it was in better light and better weather in the summer. Uh, so you can see that, you know, I did a few of uh, my shots like that too, but you can see kind of that same side on the slightly different angle, but uh, uh, what it looks like, very different. Um, e even kind of buildings that are a little sad and neglected, if you shoot them in high contrast, black and white and very little gray, uh, you can kind of make them pop and give them an aspect that uh, kind of harkens back to what the original, the architect was originally thinking with the strong, bold forms. You focus more on the lines and not on the peeling stucco and the trash cans underneath that are hidden away and stuff like that. Uh, here's the back of a Sears. Uh, I got chased away by the guy on the corner there at some point, but he, had, he was very useful as a stand in at that moment. Um, same kind of idea. Same again. This is the front of a bowling alley in San Diego, but it's now a Shriners Temple, I should say. Palm Springs City Hall. It kind of, so high contrast can kind of boil down some of the essential elements for you and make it easier. Um, high key is the opposite of that. It's uh, low contrast, but very bright. Typically doesn't work in a gray day. Everything just looks flat when you're trying to shoot in a cloudy day. But if you're shooting in a sunny day, but you're shooting directly into the sun, uh, and overexposing the shot a bit, you can get something like this, where it's kind of low saturation, low contrast, really bright. Uh, notice it kind of eliminates shadows completely because everything's in the shadow, uh, but it does so in a kind of an agreeable way that still pops and still has a 3D look to it. Uh, this is the Barbican. The other one was a courthouse in Redwood City, by the way, in case you're wondering. Uh, the Barbican. Uh, it's some church in Adelaide, Australia. Uh, a residential tower in Abu Dhabi, uh, office buildings where Chrysler actually had his offices in San Diego, William Chrysler at one point. Um, emphasizing scale. Now this is, I have a lot of fun with this. Ezra Stoller used to love to do this too. Um, kind of showing just this massive scale of buildings next to the puny existence of man, you know, kind of, uh, to me, it almost looks like alien beings or structures like you know, that once roamed the earth or something like that, or dinosaurs. And, and it's fascinating to me. Uh, you'll see this theme over and over again in, in a lot of my shots and Instagram, because I'm always kind of seeking this sort of thing out. Um, I love putting people in for context in these cases too. I think that's really critical uh, to kind of show scale and just to show like somebody looking at it, almost assessing it as if they were looking at an alien life form or a spaceship or something like this. Uh, and some of these, like this Johansson Library in, um, I think, where is it, Worcester, Mass? Uh, anyway, um, this one is, I mean, it almost reminds me of Star Wars, like Scout Walkers or something like that. It's, it's, I'm just fascinated by this stuff. 
Um, this is the uh, lobby, one of the most underrated buildings in LA, if, as far as I'm concerned, uh, John Portman building. Uh, and, you know, something like this is a classic example. Uh, this is an amphitheater in Lyon. Uh, it just looks like a monster about to, like, just take a bite out of this, swallow that little girl whole. I think that's kind of funny. Um, I have a weird sense of humor, though, so don't, anyway, don't trust me. Um, finding symmetry and order uh, is another way to satisfy your OCD tendencies. Uh, a lot of buildings, you know, a lot, a lot of modernism is asymmetrical and you can still shoot it in a symmetrical way to exaggerate that asymmetry. Um, but some buildings like the Khan Library in Exeter, you know, just are begging to be shot as um, rectilinear as possible and as symmetrically as possible. You know, a building like this, if you're slightly off, it just ruins it. You have to, I mean, I, I think I spent like 20 minutes making sure I was lined up exactly where I needed to be. Um, and you know, this is the inside of the, the rare book library. If, if, by the way, if, after COVID, if any of you get a chance, this is one of my favorite buildings. I highly recommend going. It's just stunning. Those um, uh, panels, uh, alabaster, whatever they are, the stone panels where the light filters through in just an amazing way. Uh, this is an interior of a church in Washington, DC. It's very organic, kind of alien-like. Um, so this is where it gets fun. I do this a lot. This is almost therapeutic for me. Um, removing the, the stuff, like all the decluttering, basically. Uh, because one of the things that causes buildings, especially mid-century modern buildings, to go invisible is when uh, they, they get transformed over time or, you know, they get covered with signs or things like electrical conduit, like the facade of this building here. And it's kind of hard to see, but you, I mean, Stuff like this, and this building's fairly well preserved, but some idiot decided to put all this conduit on the facade of the building, which really like creates lines where there weren't intended to be. And, and maybe it's just me, but I, I just, it drove me nuts when I saw it. So as soon as I took this photo, I knew I would have to fix it. Um, so I went through and I removed all the conduit for them. Um, maybe they'll get the hint and actually do it in real life, but it was therapeutic doing in Photoshop anyway. Um, Safety being safety, you know, in the 50s, they didn't care if you fell off of a ledge and broke your leg. But nowadays, they, you know, codes mandate all this safety stuff, although the staircase still escaped from that. And power lines are everywhere. So uh, removing those is, is also kind of therapeutic. Uh, it certainly gets to the essential elements of the building and allows the eye to not be distracted by all of the clutter. Uh, even less, you know, more subtle stuff with like these lights on this uh, Chrysler building in Palm Springs, Akatia Lodge. Um, you know, just remove the lights and you create more of a graceful look. Now, of course, if you remove the lights, you can see the shadow down below. You also have to make sure that you're removing them from the shadow. Um, I've been caught doing that before too, and that's no good. Um, back to that other building where that CenturyLink van is probably still parked there. Um, I couldn't come back a third time, so I eventually you know, fr got frustrated and decided to remove them in Photoshop. Now, I didn't have any of the information. Photoshop's not magical. You can't just press a button and make that happen. It's all manual. Um, the only way I was able to do that was by taking um, some of the building, the archway elements from the top of the building and reversing them and changing their, um, their, their form and making them uh, fit in the bottom side. So there's all kinds of tricks like that. And yes, it's a pain. This took several hours to do. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're a glutton for punishment, but um, it can be done if you absolutely have to. But architects a lot of times will just say, oh, just Photoshop it out. Um, yeah, you, maybe, but you need the data behind it or you can't do much. And it's also gonna take hours. Um, fire departments are killjoys these days because they insist on sprinklers everywhere and stand pipes and stuff. So when this building was designed, none of those things were in it. Uh, so the interior, which I didn't show you, is also a mess because it was this beautiful waffle slab ceilings, but now they're co covered with uh, sprinklers, pipes everywhere. Uh, but I could at least remove the stand pipes from the side of the building and give it a cleaner look. Um, somebody went, you know, ruined this by putting an ugly gate there. Uh, so I had to get rid of that. I also got rid of that palm tree since it was doing weird things. Um, back to that crappy signage. Um, this, I love this building, but most people are that live in Canberra are completely unaware of it. Or if they are, they don't pay any attention or think it's anything special. 
there are there's a core group of people there that know what I'm talking about though. So um, I went ahead and took the liberty of removing the signage. And uh, it's amazing because I've shown this picture to people that lived and worked right next to it. And they hadn't even noticed the building before. They, they'd been there, they walked past it for years. I showed them this and they didn't even know where it was uh, because they'd stopped seeing it. They'd stopped noticing it. So uh, we talked about light We talked about shadow. Uh, shadow is, is, I love shadow too, even dark shadow where you can't see anything, but playing with shadow and the patterns that it casts on these buildings is an important element that a lot of architects in the time period certainly took into consideration. And so as a photographer, I need to as well. Um, it's useful too to frame a shot. Yes, that's me again, sorry. Um, you can use it as a way to kind of bring the uh, make the the landscaping. This is Dan Kiley landscaping in this uh, Saarinen house. Uh, you know, make it part of the image, make it part of the composition in a way that uh, I'm sure Kylie intended, but you don't often see. Um, you know, this is a kind of a my take on a classic Ezra Stoller shot of the uh, Marin County uh, Civic Center. Uh, one thing I had always wondered about it though is that he didn't actually wait for the sun to be in there and cast that little spot in the middle. Maybe that was intentional and he thought it was too contrived, but I'm not, I, I don't care. I'm happy to stoop to that level of, um, you know, being contrived because I thought it was fun. Um, here's another example. This is a Chrysler building at Sandpiper. You know, he, he intentionally, he was kind of, he pioneered putting these shadow blocks as facades, which would change with the light and create these patterns. Uh, but he also created these overhangs and that creates an interesting pattern too. So go with that, show, show what the architect intended. Uh, you know, things like these overhangs, this is at Cal State Pomona. Um, you know, the, let's play with those a little bit, have some fun. In this case, this trellis work that, you know, on the entryway can't really be seen very well, but if you hit it at the right time of day, it casts this neat shadow on the entry on the side of the building. Here's another example of light filtering through. Now it's clear that the architect, when he designed the space, wanted this to happen. So if you're going to photograph something like this, definitely wait until the light is on that side of the building so you get these interesting patterns. Um, in this case, I needed to photograph the fact that there was a, um, a like a terrace out up on the roof that they had added. Uh, but I, I also needed to photograph the courtyard and everything. So I just had a student stand up there and use their shadow. Another way to tell the story with the shadow. Um, Lautner uh, created these little indents in the building intentionally. So they create this sort of darts on the building at certain times of day. So you definitely want to wait and photograph the side of the building when those darts are in place. Um, kind of show what these shade structures that Frey had intended were for. Uh, you can use shadow, this is in Dubai, um, to emphasize certain elements. When there's a lot of chaos in the streets, like there is in Old Town Dubai, uh, you know, your eye can be distracted by all of that stuff. So um, photographing it in a way that casts a lot of the chaos in shade, but the architectural element in light uh, is pretty easy, effective way to do it. Uh, this is in uh, Hoi An in, in Vietnam. Not quite as cast in shade because I still kind of liked what was happening down below but I did want the focus of the eye to be on these mid-century modern concrete houses in the detail in them above the kind of the chaos of the market there. Um, shooting in bad weather. I get lots of questions about this. Um, so here's my example, shooting in bad weather. Um, just don't, uh, I, sometimes you have to anyway. Um, so I found this weird church in the middle of nowhere in France and uh, I'd always dreamed of photographing it in the sun uh, my whole life, but the, when I finally got there, it was raining buckets and foggy and I could hardly see. Um, I waited around for a while, the rain kind of stopped and sort of the, like the fog started lifting off of the grass. So I was able to get a shot that I liked. It's kind of more unique and different than what I had in mind, but um, it can be frustrating, definitely. You have to kind of go into every shoot ready to adapt to whatever the circumstances are especially in Southern California in the summer when you've got marine layer and it's kind of happens at random and you never know when you're gonna be dealing with it or not. Uh, this building in, in California was raining that day. I had to photograph this uh, after it had just been remodeled. Uh, and it was these really bad clouds over the whole day, but I could see a point in the horizon where the clouds were, there was a gap between the horizon line and the clouds. 
And so I figured if this, when the sun dipped between the clouds and the, just for a split second before it went, before it set, it would cast a bit of direct light. And sure enough, I had maybe two or three minutes of this before the sun finally went down behind the horizon and I lost it. But it was enough just to get, you know, at least one shot that and it, and it created this nice contrasting effect. But sometimes you just have to fake it, like at the Tiki Resort in Lake George in upstate New York, where it was raining buckets that day too. And I was shooting this for the guide and it was, seemed really depressing and weird to shoot a Tiki Resort in the rain and fog. Um, so I ended up kind of Photoshopping it in. I Photoshopped sun, uh, but it's not something that I would recommend. And, you know, it looks kind of cheesy, but you know, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. I'm not proud, but that's all right. Um, evening photos, those are kind of like low hanging fruit. Uh, everybody likes evening photos, especially with mid-century modern architecture, uh, you know, because there's so much glass in everything that finding, that, that shooting them at twilight or in the evening where they're projecting, it really in emphasizes the indoor outdoor nature of this architecture in a, in a really special way. And they're very dramatic. And I love doing them. The only problem is, is that there's, this is a very limited window of time every day where you can do shots like this. So you have to be very careful. You have to move very quickly when it happens. Sometimes when I'm at somebody's house shooting all day, but I'm kind of waiting for this time and, and then they break out all the drinks and want to do happy hour, right? As this is happening and I'm frantically running around trying to get everyone in place and make all this happen. And they're right, they're in their relaxed mode at that point. So it, it turns, it makes it challenging, but, uh, but fun. Uh, but it, it really does, it is a special time to do and there's different periods. It all happened within about 15 minute intervals. You go from sort of like the early evening uh, period, like the golden hour to this, to, um, to like cobalt, kind of that nice blue hour period, which lasts about another 30 minutes and usually doesn't last an hour depending on where you are. Um, you know, and then you get, so you can, what, what's really nice about this is that you get sort of this nice contrast between the really cold blue light outside and kind of the warm yellow light in the interiors. And it really draws your, draws your eye into that. At the same time, it emphasizes the indoor outdoor nature. Uh, and it can create this sort of warm feeling or you kind of, you, you're, you're drawn to it in a way that hopefully gives you kind of the feels and you, you have this sort of visceral reaction to it, which is nice. Uh, but the transparency of it and everything is, is, is something that I really like too. But I mentioned it's kind of low hanging fruit and it's almost too easy sometimes. It's, it's tough to balance the light, to not blow, blow out highlights and details. But sometimes I try to achieve the same thing during the middle of the day. And so I do a lot more of that. Plus in the summer, I get tired of waiting around for hours for the sunset to set. So I'll, I'll often try to just you know, get these shots done and achieve the same sort of thing during the middle of the day if I can. But that said, if I'm around and I can do it, uh, it's always fun and it's, it's always it's always a nice effect. There's a few more. So black or white, black and white or color. This is another question I get all the time. Excuse me, I'm drinking my cocktail. Um, anyway, certainly black and white is great for mid-century modern architecture because we're so used to seeing the photos of people like Balthazar Korab or Julius Shulman or Ezra Stoller. And these iconic photos are usually in black and white. And it's kind of easy to make them look almost like they were a vintage photo themselves that way, um, like the Palm Springs City Hall here. Um, but it's also fun to try to do them. Like I, I gave this one kind of a Kodachrome slide effect, uh, you know, in color. and, and that to me is almost more challenging to try to achieve kind of a color effect and make it still look vintage, but also color. Uh, so I have some fun with that. But that said, um, there are lots of, it is kind of fun to try to reproduce that sort of high contrast, the compositions of the time period, uh, and also the kind of the effects of the black and white can do to these buildings. And it really does a nice job of, of emphasizing the architectural detail and sort of trimming out the rest. Your eye immediately goes to the bold lines and the things that the architect wanted you to focus on. So it's easy to understand why, um, like even house photography is, is black and white. And a lot of, even when color existed, a lot of architects preferred uh, that their photographers shot in, in black and white instead. But, you know, here's an example of a, of a hotel in Washington, D.C. And it's, yeah, it's nice in black and white. It's great. 
But I actually prefer the color one because to me, one of the main features here is sort of those uh, lights in the entryway. And you can see in black and white, you don't really notice them as much as you do in, in the color version. And then people. Um, when I'm shooting, a lot of times I get architects will tell me they don't want people in the shots in even like for for the fight in books and stuff. They always tell me no people, no people. Uh, but to me, architecture is about the people that wouldn't exist if not for the people. Uh, so I try to put people in as much as possible. Like imagine this shot, which is also Abu Dhabi. Uh, Architects Collaborative did this. Um, imagine what this would look like if there wasn't a person in the shot. Uh, it would be kind of pointless to me. I, I mean, yes, there are great photographers, some who are watching or listening right now. So apologies to you guys who shoot all the time more abstract photography of uh, buildings and never put people in them. And they do beautiful work and I love their work. But it, to me, I try to always ground my buildings in so that you, don't, you still know that they're a building and you still know that there are people there interacting with the building. And so putting the people in the shot is important. Uh, so here's another example. Um, to me, just having the person standing there uh, makes all the difference because it, it, you're able to kind of put yourself in the shot a lot easier. And it's fun, like this little boy in this building, it kind of breaks it up and makes you not take yourself or the building too seriously at the same time. It humanizes it. And a lot of structures that seem kind of almost otherworldly, um, having somebody in them is a good way to ground them as well. So anyway, that's why I do it. And I'm always an advocate. So oftentimes I don't use models. I'll either use myself as you've seen if I run out of patience, but usually what I'll do is I'll frame a shot and then try to discreetly act like I'm not waiting for to take the photo. And then I'll wait for people to walk in the shot and I'll take, take a photo without them realizing it. Um, the cloud whisper. So people sometimes have called me this because I do shots like this. So I are used to, I don't do this as much anymore, but I, whenever I see crazy cloud formations, I'll often go out and look for buildings to shoot in front of them because I, I try to figure out ways of letting the, the architecture speak to the clouds. So this sort of cloud porn, I, I really like and I'll do where I can, but I've kind of gotten away from only doing this sort of thing. Uh, but I also like contrails. Although every time I post a shot like this, I'll get some conspiracy theorist or three comment on them being chemtrails and then I end up having to shut them down or enter in a debate or delete them. So um, I, that gets old, but I, I do like contrails as well. I think they're fun and they can add to the building. Here's another example. I was really excited when I had to take photos of, the, of norms because it's kind of jet age and to have contrails in the shot seems like a perfect compliment to it. Um, you know, these wacky uh, cirrus clouds are frequent sighting in San Diego. So um, they create these really interesting formations. Um, here's another one. I, the, the, this, these, some parts of the country, they've never seen this and they think that I've just made this up or photoshopped it in. But truth is in Southern California, this is actually a common sight to see these kind of clouds, if we get any sort of clouds at all. So almost done, but uh, composition. Uh, I thought I'd comment on, I'd take a few examples of photos and comment on what I was thinking for composition. So um, here's another example of that house I showed previously of just the corner of. And you'll notice that I've created, what I'm interested in is creating kind of a progression of the eye. So I'm creating different, different focal zones and I'm letting the eye kind of walk through them. So obviously in the foreground, and then your eyes meet, it goes to the foreground first and then the middle ground and then you kind of carries you over. So you, you're moving left to right through the photo into kind of the sunset at the end. Um, so it's kind of a progression. So I'm always kind of looking for where, how, where the eye will lead because I, I think most people even subconsciously without realizing it will, what, their eye will carry themselves through. So they'll, like in a shot like this, well, you kind of zigzag back and forth. And the other thing that I like about this I put these little Easter eggs in sometimes, like, I don't know if you noticed, but there's all these, the shadows created and, and reflections created these X's everywhere, which also were picked up by the swan chair on the right and that the desk legs on the left there. Uh, so I thought that was fun. And so I did this sort of subtle call out thing. Um, in this case, final example, uh, you know, I love this building, classic Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, Johnson Wax, 
research tower, but um, most of the, those, these are glass tubes in the tower that are very difficult to see through. And most of the time, this, the way the sun reflects against the glass, you can't even tell that there's this circular tower structure in, in, inside. So Stoller figured this out when he photographed this and I basically blatantly copied him, but I made sure to position myself in a way where the sun was, uh, the building was between the sun and me, which helped illuminate the interior. Uh, but then I also got into what Stoller didn't do, but um, I got a corner of the building that showed those glass tubes so that the viewer could see. So here's the, I, I actually narrated it, so I'll just click through. So there's the translucent glass there, but then, and then I use people for scale, of course, as I always do. Um, foreground detail to explain what those glass tubes look like on the tower, so that you get kind of a close-up view of them at the same time and help explain the shot, what you're looking at. And wherever possible, I try to put that handrail into place if I'm in an elevated position so that it doesn't look like I'm floating above the, sky, the, the ground uh, and gives kind of anchors the viewer and puts the viewer into the spot where I am. Uh, and then also, you know, this is kind of the jigsaw puzzle piece where you're, it's a, every shot is a puzzle and you're constantly trying to deconflict the edges of buildings from each other. And this works both horizontally and vertically to make sure that they're they're not perfectly aligned so that you see some separation between them and you see where one building ends and the other begins. Uh, and then, of course, the rule of thirds, um, which I don't adhere to strictly, but it seems like even without paying attention to it, I, it ends up being that way a lot of times. Um, so uh, let's see, I'll, I thought I'd show kind of some good and bad examples of all this. I started with a little bit of that, but I'll show, and these are all my own photos of really bad photos that I've taken a long time ago, maybe some not so long ago, but, and then more recent ones of kind of the same thing where I've gone back. Um, and these are, so these are all my photos, feel free to laugh, uh, they're terrible. Um, but then, you know, I went back and I kind of, I still like the angle, but I was ashamed of the photo and I went back and after learning some of these techniques that I've just gone through, I went and redid them and got what I think anyway are better results. Um, in this one, I clearly had not figured out how to do color temperature yet and thought this was a fun, a good photo at one point. Um, you know, and then this is far more balanced with light and color temperature and everything. Um, Pond Springs Bank, gazillion photos of this, nothing special about that, but I wanted to try to kind of make, give it a more dynamic feel. Um, I was so proud of this. This is a Corbusier building from the 20s in Paris, in, in my actually my alma mater at the University of Paris. I was so excited about this. I even misspelled my name uh, when I did the little copyright. I was into. I thought I should copyright everything at one point. Not that anyone would ever want to steal this, but at the time I was convinced they would. Apparently, um, but then you know this is still another crappy day, flat light, but you know making the most of it. It was actually snowing that day when I when I took it, but. What I did here is I, I got up closer and I took a more dynamic shot that emphasized the parts of the building that I think are more architecturally interesting. Uh, this is a building cantilevered in San Diego at UCSD over the cliffs. Uh, and then, you know, went back and took a better view of it, better time of day, better light, slightly better angle, you can see inside. Uh, so how do you know if you've been successful? Uh, when you take a photo, a lot of times I don't. And in fact, I'm usually a pretty terrible judge of it. Sometimes I'll post something on Instagram that I think I've just crushed it and I'm going to kill it. And I'm going to get a gazillion likes and everyone's going to like me and I'm going to be really popular. And um, nobody likes the photo and I'll get like, you know, just like meager amount of likes and, and just like, and, and I'll be convinced there must be some fluke in the Instagram algorithm. So I'll post it later again and I'll still, it'll still happen. So I'm a poor judge. I really have no idea, but there are things that I like and I like photos that tell a story, um, some sort of cinematic quality. This photo to me kind of almost looks like a 1960s Italian um, movie, you know, like a new, new wave film or something like uh, Marcello Mastronani. Um, I like something that sparks some sort of emotion, whether it's vertigo or something else. Um, again, whatever the emotion might be, I like, uh, you know, I like, I like buildings that I like photographs that'll that'll make you well they'll place you in a place and make you want to be there and just hang out um, or create some sort of nostalgia uh, make you reminisce for home um, so anyway to me architecture is an emotional experience 
to me, it's all about the experience. It's tough to try to translate uh, that feeling of being someplace and what you're feeling there into a from a two two dimensional medium like photography. But the challenge is one of the things that keeps me coming back again and again. So I think the architectural photography to be really successful should be successful at conveying some of that emotion, some of that feeling. So that's that. Thanks, Darren. <laughs> you're getting a lot of questions. People have. Um... Uh, thank you for that. I was really uh, struck by how you were speaking about um, the, how some of these buildings aspire to be great and then and how you're really bringing that out. I wanted to, uh, we, I see Raymond there. Before we get into some questions, I wanted to introduce a special guest. Uh, Dr. Raymond Neutra is joining us. And Raymond, do you want to say a few words about architecture and photography before we get into the questions? Well, I'm blown away by all the things that have been made explicit that sometimes I sensed but didn't know what was going on. And um, uh, there are a couple of things I want to, to say. Uh, architectural photography is always limited that you have one or two images that is going to represent a building. And um, the economics of it uh, restrict that. But there may be a new form that Instagram may make possible. My friend Josh Gorell has been living at the uh, my dad's uh, level health house. And he's been taking pictures at all times of day and from all angles in a way that would be completely impossible uh, if you were publishing this in a book. And he's seeing aspects of that building that I've never seen before. And, and, and just being in the building, I've now had a chance to sl sleep at that building twice in the last year. It was my dad's first building. And then my wife, Peggy Bauhaus, and I uh, got to visit his last building in, in, in Lille, France, that almost nobody has ever seen. Um, so that, that's one thing that, that's kind of interesting to me. And the other one is that uh, we the video. you could take photographs, let's say, for a historic documentation where in a very boring way you go okay. on, in all directions to document everything. And uh, there, that's almost... Uh, it would be rare to have a beautiful image if you do it that if you do it that way. And then the third thing is that uh, there's some uh, photographic anthropologists who've been interested in uh, people in buildings, but not so much to to provide scale, but to somehow document how they're interacting with the building. Um, and um, I think that's that's another new dimension that, that would be possible. Um, I I grew up uh, tagging along with my dad and Julius Schulman as a kid, um, uh, pushing the client's furniture out of the frame and putting some Neutra furniture in, or or holding some boughs uh, in front of the, the film and stuff, and so. I'm a passionate amateur photographer. Peggy and I live in Pacific Grove, which is near Monterey and is a wonderful uh, Victorian neighborhood. And, and uh, it's very irritating to go walking with the dog with me because I'm seeing some wonderful curlicue things that are catching the light or something like that. And, and have to stop. I took this picture here. There's a that's Klaus Leuschel standing in front of one of my dad's uh, buildings, looking out at the Jungfrau. There. Oh, thank you, Raymond. And if anyone is new to the conversation about modernism, uh, Raymond is the youngest son of architect uh, Richard Neutra, and he's talking also. He's referring to photographer Julius Schulman, uh, who's been as world renowned for his art, his uh, photographs of mid-century modern structures, especially Neutra's work. 
Um, we gave a plug to the Nitro Institute for Survival Through Design here today. Mm -hmm. uh, my 93-year-old uh, brother, Dion, left a request of three Nitro Design buildings to this existing nonprofit that uh, it, its original goal from 1962 was to try to to advance evidence-inspired design. And, and now neuroscience and environmental psychology have advanced a lot. And so we're looking at ways to try to celebrate and promote that aspect of architecture. And then also the preservation of the natural legacy to stimulate conversations about enduring needs that we're going to have to accommodate in different ways that once we get on to the moon, we're not going to have sliding glass doors. And when Los Angeles is 120 degrees at midnight, we'll have a different looking architecture that will have the same human needs to accommodate. And uh, Raymond, I'm putting the link for the Neutra Institute for Survival Through Design into the chat so everybody can, can follow that and see what's happening. So uh, thank you so much for coming on and, and uh, we have a lot of questions for Darren. <laughs> and so, uh, thanks Raymond. <laughs> okay, Darren, I wanted to start with a question from our friend Allison from Phoenix. So she says, uh, when you're doing a keystone correction of a very tall building and then want to reduce the building's height so it is more naturally scaled, do you reduce it all in one swoop or divide the building into thirds or how do you make it appear more natural in height? Uh, all of the above. Um, it's it, you can't just do it in one swoop because it's the, the, end, the edges of the building are stretched more than the middle of the building. So when you're adjusting it, you actually have to do it almost like an accordion, but you have to do it in, in little bits increments at a time. You have to do it probably four or five times in small increments progressively um, at the edge rather than trying to do it all at once. I lost you, Sam. <laughs> I muted, what an amateur over here. Anyway, um, we have lots more questions. So uh, one of the primary questions is what kind of a lens do you use? So I'm sure it says, do you use a, P a PC NICOR lens? And I'm gonna combine that with the second question, how will drones affect your work? Um, I don't use Nikon. I, I mostly use Canon these days. Uh, so, but I do use uh, TS lenses, which is the Canon term for so PC is perspective control that's what the Nikon calls but what I showed you um, was actually the, the typical setup that I use which is a uh, 50 megapixel DSLR with a with a I have a suite of Canon tilt chip lenses that I use and but I also have used technical cameras uh, which allow you to move the sensor in the lens it's basically a steel plate with gears on either side, and you can use the move the sensor or the lens independently. Um, but those are kind of a pain to do. They're very expensive and they're very unwieldy. Uh, so I, I don't use that setup nearly as much as I used to. And I typically just rely, because resolution has gotten so good for DSLRs, I usually just use a 50 megapixel DSLR and a system of tilt shift lenses. So I had a question from Facebook. Somebody was asking you um, how you edit uh, your uh, your photos to make them great uh, real estate shots. I think it's a realtor who wants to know how to make a, a good photo look like a great listing. Um, so that's kind of a loaded question because the real estate photography and architectural photography are kind of two different things. Uh, most real estate photographers work on volume. The, they don't do much editing. They will take a lot of shots. They will, I mean, this, this is stereotypical and it's not fair to all of them, but a lot of them will use the widest angle lens possible to make the rooms look really big uh, and take a lot of shots and not edit them and give you a CD and for a hundred bucks or whatever. And the only way you can really make money on that model is not spending any time editing. Um, whereas architectural photographers might, you know, as, as Raymond talked about, there's a lot of work in each photo. So we, I might produce 10 images of a house rather and we're not, whereas a real estate photographer might do uh, 100 images of a house. Um, and I will spend two, three, four weeks editing the photos where they won't spend any time at all. So it is possible, but I'd say to that realtor, if they want to do that, 
they'd have to be prepared to hire an architectural photographer rather than a real estate photographer and to spend a lot of time editing the photos or to have them edit and, and just be prepared to spend a little more money. Great. Um, another question was, um, what is the most risky, dangerous thing that you've done as a photographer? Oh, I don't know that I've ever ranked them, but I've certainly, I've been attacked by dogs. Uh, I fell down a cliff in Berkeley once. Uh, I lost my shoe. I tore my jeans on a barbed wire fence. Um, I've, I've fleed from multiple security guards. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's lots of things like that, but, but the, uh, a lot of when I'm, when I'm shooting, obviously on assignment, there are things like, you know, balancing over, I, I climbed up a fire escape once that was about 200 feet off the ground. And there was, I didn't have a safety harness on or anything, and it was just the ladder. So that was bad. I wouldn't do that again. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, but there, I mean, if I'm shooting on assignment, I'm usually reasonably safe. I might be perched on the edge of the house or something like that. But if I'm shooting a project where I'm just trying to get a good angle and I'm trying to avoid having the homeowner or a security guard notice me, um, don't do this at home. You didn't hear me say that. Is this recorded? Um, but in that case, then I might take more risk. Like I might be climbing over a fence or climbing up a tree or something like that, but just to get a better angle. And, and, uh, and I'm usually trying to do so in a discreet way because uh, people seem to take offense at having being photographed for some reason. Yeah, and we had some good, uh, some people asking about your cat and the chairs in the background and what is uh, the history of your house that you're in right now? I didn't notice if the cat was made. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the cat is a Bengal um, mm -hmm. named Maple, um, but the chairs, yeah, there's a there's a papa bear chair and an egg chair and a couple of beam sarin organic chairs, I guess, in the background. Uh, the house I'm in is, uh, was designed in 1959 by William Kreisel. Uh, well, he was part of Palmer and Kreisel. It's part of a tract development here in San Diego. Great. So, Darren, we have another special guest for you. It's all surprises on our webinars, and it has to do with your book uh so <laughs> sam is going to join us <laughs> for just a Blue quick Bell. second yeah. sam, you there <laughs> everybody great to see you darren great to thanks for having me on likewise good to see you i just I, wanted to I, give I, a little surprise there darren. the good thing i didn't say anything bad about him during the presentation yeah i was waiting for it i i, I uh i uh remember very well when you uh fell down the cliff in berkeley uh yeah. The repercussions from that you were still pretty shaken when i saw you uh, yeah i wasn't sure i was going to recover from that one as well as i did and but i i only broke one lens and i only lost one shoe yeah that's pretty good yeah darren is uh the, the bravest uh one of the bravest uh people i know <laughs> so sam and darren are you planning to do a midwestern book so you've both worked on the mid-century modern architectural travel guide for east and west did you think that midwestern might be in the future if uh, you can, you can that. convince them, convince <laughs> Biden to take it on, then we're, we're on board. We've I think we have a lot of fans. <laughs> We've done the preliminary research, but uh, we, haven't, we haven't started it yet. I mean, we were thinking of it. COVID kind of sidelined that a little bit. Yeah. But yeah. We'll see. We hope I mean, so. That, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many great, like, Boyer buildings in Minnesota, for instance. I mean, they're, they're all over the, the Midwest. It'd be wonderful to see that. Oh, we know. <laughs> and then Sam, congratulations on finishing your new book, uh, Life Meets Art. Uh, it's about, it's inside the homes of the world's most creative people. It looked interesting. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Oh, we should have put Darren's home on there. I think we blew it. Next ah, time. we'll get it next time. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Sam. I'm glad you could come on. <laughs> yeah, it's great to see you and always great to, uh, thanks, thanks, Christine and, uh, and, and Darren, always great to see you and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, despite COVID, we'll get to work together soon. <laughs> yeah, good to see you, brother. Yeah, you too. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. So, Darren, we had a couple more questions. One is, uh, for is what are you drinking? Uh, is that the old fashioned that we handed out the cocktail recipe? Well, it was. <laughs> I need a refill. I, I had a little teeny tiny drink. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we had some other questions. Uh, Raymond uh, also Raymond Neutro asked uh, also asked if you use. Uh, drones, or do you see any how uh, using drones in the future for some photography? I have. Um, most of the time, though, I, I don't 
do them myself, but I have friends and collaborators that do the drone thing. So they're licensed, you know, and they're a lot of times when I'm doing doing drone photography, it's in areas that are crowded or you it requires special permission. I just and, and I'm also photographed I'm, or I'm, I'm focused for during while I'm photographing on taking the photos that I need to take. So I would rather not have to be distracted by worrying about that at the same time. So I, I will art direct the photos that I want from a drone pilot, but I won't typically bother with them. I'll give them kind of a, a shot list or a storyboard of what I'm looking for. Uh, and then I'll just send them on there and let them do it on their own. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm seeing more and more customers, clients want that. Not so much for the mid-century stuff, to be honest, but for the contemporary stuff. Because you know, most of what I do, at least for uh, you know, for professional commissions, is actually new projects. And the drone photography is becoming increasingly almost just obligatory for that. Um, a lot of times, though, to be honest, buildings aren't really designed. They're built. They're designed to be experienced from a human level, from ground level, and not necessarily from the sky. So. I've seen many cases where architects have, I've shown them the drone footage and they're kind of disappointed by it because they didn't really, I mean, yeah, you see the rooftop stuff and you know, you see the trees and things like that, but sometimes it's good. You can get some, if it's on a cliff or something, you can get some dramatic shots that way. But a lot of times you're kind of underwhelmed by what you, what you get. So it just depends on the project really. So there was a question from Joe in the Q and A box. Um, she was saying she heard a uh, Julius uh, Schulman lecture at LACMA years ago, and um, Julius said that he sometimes used infrared film to increase uh, contrast. Is this something you've used in your work, or um, I I've played with infra infrared film. So when I learned photography, I didn't completely explain all my bio, but I did I did take photography courses in high school. And I was a photographer on the school newspaper. So I do kind of get a little bit of the photographer vibe and in that culture. Um, but I learned, so I learned on film and I did shoot infrared film and experimented that, that way. But with digital, it becomes kind of OBE. You can kind of imitate the effect of infrared with digital, but you would just do that in post-processing. Uh, but there are other ways to, to emphasize. I mean, you can also put filters on lenses uh, to create that effect too. But most of the time I just increase the contrast uh, through post-processing rather than, because that way if I have a raw image, I can do pretty much anything I want with it later. It, more flexibility, whereas if I'm putting filters on, uh, you know, you kind of, there's no correcting that afterwards. You, you have, it is what it is, but if you don't like the result, you can't really fix it. So another question from a lot of people is about uh, the privacy of the owners or the building occupants. Um, one person was asking uh, what your thoughts are on maintaining the privacy of the users while you're shooting it. And the other question was if you've ever had any issues with building owners or residents concerned about their privacy. Yeah, there are, and Sam can, could talk to this too if he was still on, because we encountered this a few times with the guidebooks. Uh, but honestly, fewer than we actually probably imagined. There, there are people that aren't happy about that, uh, but the, I mean, from a legal perspective, as long as you're photographing from a publicly accessible spot, you're okay. Um, you can you can do what you you want. Now that said, we've been in public streets before, and there are a few projects that aren't in either book that, that should have been, where we were photographing like a house from the street, and we had the residents come out and ask us what we were doing, and said they really didn't want to be in the book. We were within our rights to still do it anyway, but we chose to respect their wishes and we decided to omit those projects from the book when they happened. Um, but I'll, and I'll try to be sensitive, even just like posting on Instagram and stuff. I won't post the location of a home. Uh, I won't post the name of the people that live there. I won't put them in the photo. Uh, most of the time, if I'm even if I'm photographing people, I will blur the people, you know, by shooting long exposure, or I'll put them um, with their back to me or whatever. So I do, I do appreciate that. I think that we've gotten almost overly sensitive to the idea. I mean, people, I mean, you, you show up with a camera and a tripod somewhere and you will get Department of Homeland Security on you within five minutes sometimes now, um, which is a bit sad, I think, that we've gotten to this point. I think after 9-11, people got far more sensitive to that idea and this notion that 
if you're out there with a camera and a tripod, you're up to no good, which is, um, it's just unfortunate. I mean, the, the bad guys aren't out there with cameras with tripods anyway. They're, if they want to photograph something, they're probably using an iPhone. But um, people don't seem to object to that. But they do when you, as soon as you have a tripod, you become a target. Yeah, interesting. I've and I've definitely been kicked off properties before uh, taking photos. I th have a, a question from Alan Hess. I think it might before be. You, before you go to that, just one yeah. quick follow up on that. Okay. Is, converse of that is that there were. I mean, when we were filming, when we were photographing the books, we often had like fifteen minute windows where we had to be like from one place to the next, and we had really tight schedules. And and a lot of times we would want to avoid the owners of these places not because we were worried that they would be angry, because that was frankly very, very few, like 99% of them were, were very happy to see us when they did run into us. What we were afraid of was being invited in for tea and to show the albums and everything, whereas normally we would love to do that. And Sam and I were like, I mean, we, we would jump at the occasion, but we were meanwhile, like we, that would happen to us. We'd be stuck talking to somebody for an hour or two, and we'd be like four projects that we wanted to photograph that day got blown out of, and we couldn't, we couldn't make up the time or anything because of it. But because most people, what we found that are in these homes and interesting, they, they wanted to share, they were happy to show like their photo album when they were a kid and their father commissioned, you know, and there's a picture of like my dad with Marcel Breuer or with, with uh, Neutra, you know, and ha you know, having coffee and discussing on the empty lot where this house is. So we got much more of that than we did of hostile people. Uh -huh. Oh, I believe it. I'm sure that you get uh, people want to ask you all kinds of questions. I think you told me a story once about firefighters. At some point, you were taking pictures of a was it a postmodern fire building? Yeah, uh, yeah, and the firefighters wanted to to you know set up the fire engines for you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they wanted to open the doors. They were turning on the light. <laughs> and they were positioning everything. I was like, I'm done, guys. I'm I don't need it. But they they wanted to go all out. Yeah. Well, we, we have a lot of questions. We have, we, we're running out of time. So I have one last one from Alan Hess. I think it might be a trick question Alan is here saying here. He says, who were, Alan must be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He says, who were Marvin Rand, Ernie Braun, Maynard Parker, Randall Partridge, Morley Bear, Roy Flam, Roger Sturdivant, and Pedro Guerrero? Yes, I know those are all other yeah. architectural photographers that I greatly admire and I didn't mention. In fact, just for Alan, I, I will mention that there is a longer version of this talk that, and I had a whole section of who my influences were. And all of those people that he mentioned were in that part where I would did a sort of a juxtaposition of their work and mine and how they had influenced me. But because this was only an hour talk, that section <laughs> got removed. So Alan, if you'd like a private viewing of that, I'm happy to sit down with you at some point. That's great. So um, Darren, can you tell us where everyone can catch up with you? I know you have an Instagram. I did put that in the uh, chat box. Is there anything else that you're coming up with? Um, well, I also do intermittently, I write blog posts, but I haven't done very many lately because I usually write them when I'm on long plane trips and I haven't done too many of those recently. Uh, but I, I do um, I do blog on my own website, which is darrenbradleyphotography.com or .net, I can't remember. Just Google it and it'll be in there. Um, but you'll see and you'll recognize because there's another Darren Bradley who's an architectural photographer, by the way. So don't confuse me, but you'll, our work is very different. So you should be able to figure it out. Uh, but anyway, my I do blog there. You're welcome to go look at my work there. There's also a lot more photos there because that I keep that up to date and there's plenty of... Uh, examples of my more recent work. Wonderful. Well, you're one of a kind, so I'm sure no one will confuse your work with anyone else's. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, you know, supporting CPF and sharing all of your information with everyone today. There's still kind of a, a lot of questions, but we can do is actually we can send these to Darren and we can post some of these on our Facebook, uh, if that's all right with you. Uh, that way, because people have more detailed questions about Adobe and such as, as you would expect. But um, I, I anyway. Secrets though. So. <laughs> okay. John, did you have anything else? Do you want to wrap it up? Yes, we're going to be wrapping it up, but I wanted to remind people of a few things first. First of all is, um, as Chris mentioned, we have a CPF trivia night, um, and I am going to paste into the chat box the direct link because you should register early. There's only 48 spots and um, six teams. So, um, if you want to be a part of the team, you have to register. If you don't want to be part of a team, if you want to just compete with yourself, you can uh, watch Facebook. And then second is um, our call for sessions. So I'm pasting this into the chat box as well. Um, is every year CPF asks you, uh, anybody really, 
what you'd like to see in our future year of programs. So um, we're asking you to submit your ideas for sessions, for webinars, for workshops, for other programs. And you would just visit that link that says CFP at the end, and that would allow you to submit an idea. Um, and then finally, I uh, just wanted to thank Darren and paste into the chat box our third link, which is the evaluation for today. Um, so you can let us know, let Darren know what you thought of today's program. Um, I'm sure he'd like to hear it. Uh, and with that being said, I'm going to close everything out here. And uh, we it's a wrap, I guess. Yep. Thanks, everybody. See you soon, Darren. Thanks, guys. Pleasure. All right. All right. Bye.